This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. I'm starting a new trilogy on big topics. The topic this time is happiness. Christine Vetrano is my guest. She's a philosopher who's written about the subject and the conversation will begin in a moment. This is the first in my trilogy on the idea of happiness. Uh, I am starting with philosophy and Christine Vetrano is a professor who's written on the subject and as I usually do, I'd like to give her a few minutes to talk about herself, her ideas, and also specifically what she's uh, thought about happiness. So welcome, Christine, and if you could give a little background. Sure. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I am an associate professor at Brooklyn College. Um, I have been researching happiness since I was in graduate school. Um, I actually did my dissertation on contemporary theories of happiness. Um, so that's where my interest sort of started to grow. It, it happened to coincide um, when I was starting to research my dissertation with all of the sort of research um, a lot of psychologists were doing in uh, positive psychology. So it seemed like happiness was everywhere. Everybody was talking about it. Um, I was kind of struck that the philosophers who have a, a very strong history of theorizing about happiness really weren't chiming in much. There weren't that many books by philosophers. It seemed like psychologists, economists, sociologists, everybody else was talking about it. So I jumped in and I um, did my dissertation and then I was able to, I got a few publications out of that and then I did turn it into a book. So my book is The Nature and Value of Happiness where I basically go through the different philosophical traditions in happiness. I start with you know ancient theories, I go through modern theories, contemporary theories, and then I, in one chapter I defend sort of my view, um, which is basically a, a very kind of strong departure from Aristotle and the way the ancients thought about happiness as the good life or one is leading a morally virtuous life. Um, in contrast to that, I've argued that the way we use the word today is very different, and so it's much more subjective. Um, it's sort of lost its connection to all of the goodness. Um, and so I argue that you know happiness is still a good, but it really should be seen as one good among many other goods. That doesn't necessarily imply anything about you know how morally good you are or how aesthetically good your life is or anything like that. So. Well, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this show, and let me just give a, a, a minute or two preamble as to why, and then uh, we can uh, sort of come to a little bit of concordance. Um, I have often found that uh, when people talk about happiness, especially here in the West and especially here in America, it usually has to do with notions of success, which inevitably have to do with money or status or power or fame, rather than doing something uh, just simply because it's good. Um, just recently, yesterday, for example, my wife uh, had watched this documentary on this woman named Vivian Maya, who's a street photographer who died in poverty, and now posthumously her work, her, her photographs are being seen all around the world, and there was a documentary made on her. And this is an example of one who a lot of people outwardly would have said lived a terrible life or whatnot, but at some level she was happy. But even more... Uh, even more uh, to the point is when people, if I find it disturbing when, for example, if you ask someone who's pregnant or a young couple and you say, so what, uh, what hopes do you have for your child? And say, oh, I don't care. I just want them to be happy. And I think to myself, boy, that's a pretty vain, a pretty shallow thing to do because a happiness, uh, it, number one, it, it's generally subjective. But aside from that, it, 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 it's totally a selfish viewpoint uh, where to me, some of the best things and not to, I don't want to get like cliche, like, oh, giving a present is better than getting one. But happiness is generally an ephemeral thing. It's not a constant state of being. And there are things like maybe living a, a worthwhile life. Uh, artists, great artists who may have not been happy, uh, a Van Gogh or something, still lived a worthwhile life even though they weren't happy. So to me, happiness is overrated. What is your general take on that kind of uh, view of happiness? Um, I, you said a lot of very interesting things. Um, I, I think, so there is a book by a philosopher, Abhijit Anand, who talks about this at Buffalo, um, that is literally called Happiness is Overrated. Oh. And the reason he wrote this book is because he sort of observed, not unlike the way I did, of uh, uh, the way that people use the word today and how it has sort of lost its connections to a lot of the loftier, um, more admirable qualities that Aristotle and, you know, the ancient moralists associated with happiness. And in virtue of that, he thought, well, who needs this sort of subjective, very wishy-washy concept. I don't think that's totally right. To try to defend happiness a little bit. So a couple of things. 
on the one hand, with the baby, I think when people say they want them to be happy, they're talking out of two sides of their mouth at the same time. They mean they want the person to be satisfied with their life. They want their baby to be satisfied with life. I want that for my children, too. I want them to lead lives that they feel are worthwhile and satisfying, regardless of whether they're you know, wealthy, successful, have jobs that make a lot of money, have jobs that are volunteer work. I don't care. As long as they're satisfied with what they do and they enjoy their lives, I think that's important. However, when people say, oh, I just want them to be happy, they're not really telling the truth there because they don't mean happy as a person selling drugs, happy if it's a daughter as a stripper or a prostitute or, you know, a pornography, you know, a pornographer or whatever. So I think that although people might say, oh, I just want to be happy, there's all kinds of caveats on that. I want to be happy in ways that I think are acceptable, morally or otherwise, you know? I mean, they're, you know, uh, anyway, so I think that we do want um, satisfaction for ourselves and for our loved ones. I do think happiness is a very important good. Um, I also think, to try to boost up happiness a little bit, although it is possible to achieve happiness through thoroughly immoral means, as you suggest. And many artists and people who do wonderful, great things are not happy. I still think that if you can find happiness and through your work, through your interactions with others, your family, your friends, people you know, doing good things for your community, that's even better. And for many people, and the psychologists have can back me up on this with their studies, you know, for many people, that is the source of their happiness. So I think our happiness is a function of our goals and our values. I don't think those are objectively determined. So I do think happiness is a subjective concept. Your values are your own, your priorities, your hierarchy of what's important to you. That's your own. However, for many people, they wouldn't be happy uh, acting like a Bernie Madoff or some other figure who is wealthy and powerful and doesn't treat people very well. Um, I think for many people... Happiness just comes from trying to be a good parent, trying to be a good sibling, trying to be a good friend. And so our happiness necessarily involves a lot of moral goods, um, just because we wouldn't be happy with ourselves or content with our lives if we weren't good in these other respects. Do you think that social definitions, the definition of happiness made by many, causes so many individuals to be unhappy because they feel rightly or wrongly, a sense of peer pressure. And when they don't get to the cultural idea of happiness, they feel inadequate, even though they could achieve their own personal happiness if they had the inner strength and resolve to do so. I think you're totally right. I, I completely agree with that. Um, I see it in my students. I teach a class on happiness once a year, pretty much every year. It usually fills immediately. And I get students who are a pretty broad swath of the university. They're mostly not philosophy majors. I get all kinds of students who are just curious about happiness. And one thing I find when we go through these different theories, and I say, look, these are just from each of these theories that we do, you can call advice, right, about, and, and Granted, a lot of the theories that we do at the beginning are, are 2,000 years old, 2,500 years old, but they advise, like the Stoics, to you know work on your inner qualities, not necessarily make demands on the world, or Epicurus, reduce your desires, reduce your dependency on material goods, and then you'll have more time to enjoy your life, and you won't be so feeling like you're in a rat race, that you have to compete, that you're... And I tell them these things, and it's very sort of... I mean, a lot of it is very sort of trite, a lot of it is commonsensical, um, but they take it in like, oh, that's right, I, I I forget that a lot of your happiness is within your control. And I think, as you suggest, living in a society that we live in that's so media-driven and social media-driven, and these kids growing up today, I mean, it's it inundates every aspect of their lives. I think there is a lot more pressure to uh, live the way other people live, compete, keep up, um, you know, in all different socioeconomic levels. And I think that there's a lot of pressure on people to be happy and to be, you know, to, to have this great existence when in reality, you know, that may not be the norm, that may not be your reality. And so you, I think you have to do a lot of work on yourself if you want to come to terms with this stuff. I don't know that enough people do. And I think taking courses in college you know, in psychology and philosophy and the humanities where you study these kinds of things and you read the old theories and the new theories kind of reminds you that, you know, we have a lot more control over our lives than we think we do. Yeah, I think one of the problems that I notice with people and happiness is they they expect to be given, especially like younger children, and I think every younger generation is more shallow when they're young, but, you know, for 2,000 or so years since the Romans, Everyone's always complaining about the younger generation, but younger people generally 
uh, have a sense of self-entitlement that after you've worked 20 or 30 years, you realize the world doesn't give a damn about you. But uh, there's a great Japanese film uh, by a filmmaker called Yasujiro Ozu. He did a, a trilogy of films called the Noriko Trilogy. Uh, and in one of the films called Late Spring, a father played by a great Japanese actor, Chishu Ryu, has a daughter played by another great Japanese actor, Setsuko Hara, and he wants to marry her off before he dies. And a lot of Ozu's films deal with these small things. And in the film, the daughter doesn't want to just get married off. She wants to stay and take care of her father till he dies. Uh, she says that will make her happy. And the father said, father finally finds someone to marry her off. And she, even the night before the wedding, wants to stay with and take care of her father. And he says, no, that's wrong. And she, and she says, but father, uh, it'll, I can have no more happiness than to take care of you. And he says, he says, that's wrong. He says, you will, you will find happiness with your husband and, and the family. He says, he says, happiness is not a thing that is given. Happiness has to be created. And it's one of the, the wisest things I, I've seen in films and one of the reasons Ozu has these insights in his films. But that seems to be a lesson wholly not followed now. The idea that you're somehow entitled to happiness because we have the right to, to pursue happiness uh, rather than you have to go out and create it. You just can't expect your parents to hand it to you. You can't expect society to hand it to you. Do you think that what, what do you think about that notion? And do you think that society has become, you know, and I don't want to use the entitlement society in the way that right-wing people talk about you know, basics of getting food stamps or something, but the idea that people just don't want to work to be happy, they expect it handed to them. I, I think there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. I, again, I think it's also sort of cultural in that when you look around you and you see uh, everybody in the same boat or having the same kinds of experiences, you kind of lose your perspective a little bit. Um, I think that is especially true of us here in America, just to take one example. Um, and you see this in you know the rates of antidepressants and, and various other antipsychotics, um, anti-anxiety medication, sleep medication. I mean, from what I've understand from the statistics, our rates of many of these sort of you know our rates of depression and you know that that requires medication and our rates of like the other sort of uh, more serious um, mental disorders that require antipsychotics have not changed in like 30 years yet if you look at the use of prescription medication it's skyrocket especially for very heavy duty drugs like the antipsychotics and one problem is that you know when everybody is taking these drugs because they want to be happy and they need it um, I think it normalizes that, and also there's this fear, I think, speaking to what you said before about, you know, sort of be, being surrounded by people who think that happiness just happens to them, I think there's a fear amongst people that they're not happy enough, or they should be happier, and so again, it feeds this sort of, well, I must be on medication, I should be taking that stuff too, because maybe I'm not happy enough. I think you're right, I think happiness is something you have to sort of pursue actively, I think Aristotle said that again 2,000 years ago, he said happiness is virtuous activity. It's an activity because you have to constantly be working at it, not unlike, you know, physical health. Um, you don't just become healthy by just kind of existing. You have to constantly work at it. Um, pursuing happiness works like that, you know, um, and I think that's right. I don't think enough people, again, read the ancient texts or have a sense of sort of how we've been grappling with these issues for so long. You know, for all our technological advancement, everything we've accomplished, um, as humans, fundamentally, human nature hasn't changed at all. <laughs> and so we're still dealing with the same problems. And that's why I think, you know, the fact that people aren't studying the humanities as much is, is a tragedy. And I think that feeds again into the fact that, you know, people aren't thinking enough in these more humanistic terms. Yeah, I think uh, I, this is just slightly off topic, but I know I had a, a niece who's now in 18 and going to be going to college when she was three or four years old. A uh, doctor wanted to narcotize her up with ADD. And then you have all of these these drugs that make kids happy and whatnot. And most of the times I think they grow out of them. I just, I just wonder in 20 or 30 years if these people are going to be getting, ending up with thalidomide like cancers or something because of all these drugs that are untested. But anyway, um, I wanted to talk about happiness being on a spectrum. Um, and when you talk about happiness, you have to also talk about the non-happiness and the value of not being happy, being introspective, being gloomy, learning to realize that both happiness and gloominess and every everything else between are just temporal and they will come and go is a natural part of, of life. I think one of the problems 
I find with the ideas of happiness, people, as I said earlier, think that it should be a constant state, and it can't be. Uh, do you talk, or what are your thoughts about happiness as just being something along a spectrum, and that non-happiness has a value as well? I completely, I completely agree with you. Um, so I kind of came upon that same idea myself. I actually wrote a paper um, on this exact topic. Um, it's called The Value of Unhappiness, um, and it was published by a journal, um, the journal called Think, which is actually a, a journal that is run by, it's, a, it's, a, it's from the Royal Academy, but it's, um, it's more geared towards sort of pop, it's, it's interdisciplinary and, and lay people can read it. It's not a journal that is really just for people in the field. Um, and I was happy to, I was, I was proud to have the paper published because in it I make very similar points to what you, what you just said. Um, I think that, you know, there is a value to experiencing dissatisfaction with your life insofar as it tells you that something is not right and you need to do a kind of reevaluation of what you're doing, what you're not getting that perhaps you want, why you're not experiencing satisfaction. Again, I think rather than just immediately turning to a bottle of pills to sort of fix things, you can do the kind of psychoanalysis on yourself and figure out what's wrong. Um, there are a bunch of psychologists who have been arguing, and I cite them in my paper, of the benefits of um, depression. So it's interesting that a feature like excuse me, uh, depression wouldn't, from an evolutionary standpoint, right, so what does a depressed person do? They pull away from their friends, they typically don't eat, they lose interest in a lot of normal day-to-day -day activities. One might think, gee, how can that be evolutionary beneficial? Why wouldn't depressed people be weeded out? Why do we still have people who get depressed? And their argument is that it's actually evolutionarily beneficial because the ruminative process you go through when you're depressed, this sort of thinking about your problems and mulling them over and sort of experiencing them and dealing with them is a very kind of focused thinking that often lets people solve their problems. And again, rather than sort of running away from this or kind of convincing yourself that you're happy when you're not, it's good to experience unhappiness when things in your life are not well. Now, obviously, there's a difference between sort of pathological forms of depression and happiness where, yeah. you know, you're, you have a chemical imbalance or there is something seriously wrong. For those people, of course, they should be take medication, hopefully get their lives back on track and then overcome it. But there's a whole other group of people in our society who are being medicated by people, uh, by psychiatrists and whomever else, who uh, just want to feel better and don't realize that you... It takes work, as you suggest, and that you know, just feeling bad about your life isn't always a bad thing. Sometimes it's the motivation you need. I mean, if everything is fine all the time, there's no motivation to change anything. Um, but when you have problems that need to be addressed, when you're really not satisfied with your life, the best thing you can do is feel bad about that and then fix things. Yeah, uh, you anticipated where I was going yeah. to go, and I wanted to talk about the history of happiness and ha uh, evolutionarily, but your point about uh, the someone ruminating more when they're depressed, I'm wondering if evolutionarily, since we started out as hunter-gatherers and everyone was a generalist, uh, and then we civilized ourselves, got agriculture, and people like myself who were nearsighted uh, could take up trades because... They weren't weeded out by the, you know, saber-toothed cats that uh, people with bad eyesight stumbled into. That allowed for for traits that would have been weeded out to to survive. And I'm wondering if, say, the depressive, uh, ruminative, p positive qualities might have served well when when all human beings had to be generalists in a gatherer society. But once we got into the more agricultural, civilized society, that uh, the benefits went away, but the problem still stuck. I think that's an interesting uh, point, definitely. Um, I think, you know, again, not necessarily people suffering from clinical depression, but the more sort of... Yeah, real depression. Most, depression has sort of been hijacked to be something terrible. Right, time. exactly. And I don't, I, again, I don't think it necessarily is. I mean, I don't want to over-romanticize. There's a book that uh, was written about the, um, I forget now, who, oh, um, uh, I can't recall, Against Happiness, I think it's yeah. called. Uh, he was not a philosopher who wrote it, but, um, and he sort of uh, romanticizes, you know, the depressives, the, you know, the Beethovens and the people who create dark, deep music and art and talks about how if they felt better about their lives, if they were happier people, would that be compatible with them creating these kinds of 
works of art. Um, and, I, you know, and the book kind of got panned. I mean, I own the book, but it kind of got panned by one reviewer that I thought was kind of funny because it's, he said, you know, you're, you're romanticizing, like, you know, the cold and the dark and the, you know, but yet in, in your, in your um, you know, your sort of um, acknowledgments at the end, you're talking about your wonderful life and your lovely family and these great people and these wonderful, you know, and it's like you don't have such a miserable life that you're sort of like, you're, you, you, he sort of, as he's writing the book, claims to be the sort of master depressive. And so the sort of argument is, you know, it, you're not what you're even claiming to be. Um, I don't know that, I think most people, from what I understand from the psychological literature, tend to be relatively optimistic, tend to be just by nature, you know, um, somewhat Pollyanna-ish in the sense of we think that things are going to get better. We Most of us suffer from various cognitive biases that make us view ourselves as better than we are. So most of us are not really super in touch with reality. We see things through rose-colored glasses. I don't see a problem with that. I think that even with that tendency, you know, life ebbs and flows, and I don't think it's realistic, as you said before, to expect to be happy all the time. But I think if you're unhappy all the time too, then you need to look at your life seriously and figure out what you're doing wrong, you know? Yeah, I think there's a general uh, misunderstanding about uh, unhappiness or depression and, and artistic creativity and that people think, I, I know lots of people, I've been 30 plus years in the arts myself, and there are lots of people who have zero talent, and some of them though, get famed in, in their field or whatnot, but most of them don't get anything that think that simply because they're depressive that they, they must be creative. And it's it's a it's it's sort of to me like a convergent evolution thing is that the very things that can make someone with real talent help a Mozart or a Sylvia Plath become great are gonna sure. do nothing for Joe Blow or you know, who who doesn't have that talent. But let me just get back to, to, to evolution. Um you know, when I, I have four cats and uh, they're happy when they're around me purring and I'm rubbing their bellies or rubbing under their chin or they come up to be held and, and petted. Uh, and you would think cavemen or, or early uh, hominids had similar, uh, uh, you know, base kind of reactions that, that, that complex through time. What... Let, let's let's start with the beginnings. Uh, do we have an idea of, of of happiness, how it evolved in the simian mind, you know, going back? I don't know of any research on that, which mm. is an interesting question. Um, the earliest work that we have on happiness, and it's interesting because even within the ancient Greeks, who probably, I mean, from a Western philosophical standpoint, I, I don't do Eastern, and I don't know that much about other kinds of philosophy, but just from what I know within Western philosophy, um, you know, Plato, Aristotle, these guys certainly talked a lot about um, happiness um, and specifically living a good life, trying to find your place in the world, trying to be comfortable with your life. Um, and they often associated it with moral goodness and living a kind of exemplary life. But even within the ancient Greek tradition, many of the pre-Socratics, many of the early thinkers, they didn't talk about happiness at all. Um, theirs was more of just trying to come to terms with a sort of rudimentary scientific understanding of the world. So early philosophy doesn't even really have the emphasis on happiness. I think it was more... You know, so I think that it took a certain amount of scientific advancement, cultural advancement, before we were comfortable enough to even be able to start theorizing about happiness and thinking about it and ruminating on it and all of that. Um, because from what I understand, I mean, I, I haven't seen anything um, from the animal research, you know, uh, uh, on anything related to happiness. And um, again, even the early writings we have in philosophy have nothing to do with happiness. They don't talk about it at all. It's not even something that comes up. The, the questions are much more metaphysical. Um, you know, why am I here? What, why is it? Why do these things? What's the underlying structure of the universe? You know, questions like that. Well, I was raised as a Missouri Synod Lutheran. I'm an agnostic for many years, but uh, I know Martin Luther, for many of his faults, his anti-Semitism and other things of that nature, uh, there was a very being raised in, uh, for the first eight or nine years under that, there's a very uh, uh, prescribed way of what happiness is. And it was generally an exterior idea of happiness in that someone should be happy if they are in service to the Lord, to Christ, to mankind in general, doing good deeds, i.e. that if you, know, you uh, sprained your ankle and I came and bandaged it up for you, uh, that should make me feel happy because I have done a service to you in a time of need. Um, so you said philosophy is kind of muddy on that. 
does religion then take up, is that, do you think that the, the idea of happiness, of joy, of ecstasy, of service to man or God, is that where the idea of, or the modern Western idea of happiness then you think derives from religion? Um, not necessarily. Again, I think the ancient tradition, um, certainly throughout the, the, the ancient period, or we'll leave it there because during the modern era, things changed a bit, but Certainly during the ancient times, um, there was a very strong connection between happiness and um, virtue. And virtue is, you know, a lot of the moral virtues are generosity, patience, kindness, compassion. I mean, these are the very kinds of other regarding character traits, you know, other regarding qualities that we, you know, admirable qualities that dispose you to doing good things for other people, to being of service to other people. So I think philosophy has a strong tradition. Um, perhaps predating some of the religious tradition in noting that, you know, it feels good when you do good for others, you know. Um, I mean, Aristotle kind of famously said, you become good by doing good deeds, you know. You, you become, you want to be a more compassionate person, go out and perform acts of compassion. He didn't think it was in he didn't think it was innate, he thought it was learned, he thought it was something you could do that you got through habit. And um, psychologists today, working have found that same connection that people who have a strong sense of community whether it be through religious connections or other connections it doesn't have to be religious they do tend to be happier people people who give back they do all of these studies on undergraduates where they make them do nice things for other people and that's their homework um and then or in one i remember they they had them do uh, one thing that was just beneficial to themselves and one thing that was beneficial to others and then they had to write up how they felt after each one and of course the one where they benefit themselves was sort of a hedonic, you know, oh, I felt good for a minute, and then it kind of went away, and the one that benefited others actually improved their mood, and improved their lives in some sense, they felt better about themselves, they thought of themselves as being better people, and that seemed to do a lot more for their overall life satisfaction than the trivial thing that they did, just the short-term thing that they did for themselves. So I think that, you know, and, and, and there's, you know, I've read psychologists who write on this stuff who go back to Aristotle and say, Aristotle was clearly right here, that if you want to be a good person, go out and do these good acts and I'm sorry if you want to be a happy person perform these acts of, of um, you know become a virtuous person who does good things for other people and then you'll be happier so I think certainly from the ancient schools of thought on this you definitely have that um, today I don't think again I don't think enough people take philosophy in college so I don't think I don't think enough people go to college period so I don't know how skilled people are in this history I think that you live in a very materialistic very capitalistic society you know where there's a lot of you know materialism surrounding you and I think that people get just caught up in that and associate that with happiness not realizing there's this whole tradition that talks about other things um, well, I, I, I see parallels in art. One of the things that makes me cringe when I hear young people want to be an artist in whatever form, whether it's literature, music, or, or, or painting, or visual arts, dance, or whatever, is that they say, I have something to say. And to me, art is about communication. And it's far less important what I have to say, unless that thing has some value to the person I'm trying to communicate with. And and I've often found a, a correlation, not perfect, there are exceptions, but I've found a great correlation between those artists that are seeking to, I call artists translators a reality, uh, that are seeking to, to affect others, tend to be of a higher quality than those that merely are that, me, 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 I'm here. But that's a whole nother show. Uh, let's end this segment, and in the next segment, I want to talk about your book specifically and your specific ideas about happiness since we've uh, been more theoretical and historical. So we'll do that in a moment. This show is about happiness. I'm speaking with philosopher Christine Vetrano, and she has a book called The Nature and Value of Happiness. I'll link to that and also her webpage below this video uh, so people can contact her about that. Uh, your book is titled The Nature and Value of Happiness. So let me just ask a couple of broad stroke questions to begin with. What do you define as the nature of happiness and how do you define the value of it? So I, I, the nature of it, I think, I, I think happiness ultimately is a state of satisfaction. Um, I think it's the state of being satisfied with your life. Um, I think that that will reflect your values and your priorities. People who, you know, um, are very sort of thinking about their lives a lot and, and doing a lot of self-analysis, they may have a very sort of 
strong handle on exactly what is right and wrong with their life at any given time. I think there are other people maybe who are much more sort of, you know, loosely connected to what's going on and they just feel okay about their lives. Maybe they can't isolate exactly where everything is. Um, so I don't think you necessarily have to have a very, like an inventory, but I do think ultimately that being happy is just being satisfied overall. So having a sort of positive impression or favorable view of your life, um, what is important to you, what your values are, what your priorities are, that's all going to be reflected in your understanding of happiness. And it is a balancing act. I think for all of us, I think the more things you do in your life, balancing personal and professional lives, balancing friends and family, balancing everything, you know, if you have kids and that puts another whole time constraint on everything, I think that happiness is trying to find some kind of balance between all of these different goods in our lives that we're satisfied with, trying to figure out what's important to you and hopefully realize that. Um, and the value of that, I think happiness is really important. Um, I don't think it's overrated. I think that it's in some ways one of the most important things we can have in our lives. Um, is it the most important? No. And when it comes into conflict with other values, I think that's a personal choice. You have to decide whether you want to be a happy person or a moral person or a happy person and, uh, you know, whatever other values it comes into conflict with, you know, when you think about happiness in terms of your own self-interest, which oftentimes it's a function of, um, you are kind of balancing happiness against these other goods that are out there. So I don't necessarily think, you know, and I think happiness can be construed in a longer or shorter term sense. I think that when we think of happiness with your life, we're thinking long term. So it's not just, you know, these kinds of short thrills or these short term things that you might do. It's more of you have a vision of where your life is going and you're satisfied with the direction it's going. You're, you're satisfied with the things in your life and how your life is progressing. Well, it's interesting uh, that you define happiness as satisfaction. And I think maybe that is at the core of why people are so obsessed with happiness and people don't achieve it. Because I don't think most people, if you ask them what happiness is, would say satisfaction. I think they they are looking at it as a peak, uh, a Himalayan peak, rather than a broad plateau. Uh, I'm happy because I just asked out a girl who looked as good as Halle Berry. Uh, I, I'm happy because I just got a $2 an hour raise, but my boss said I was good. Uh, I'm happy because uh, I'm out with my friends celebrating and my favorite sports team just won tonight. Um, do you think that most people share your definition of happiness? And if not, do you think that that's a problem and why? That's a great question. Um, I think, I don't know. Uh, so happiness is an interesting subject for people. I think intuitively people are excited by it. I don't know how much thinking they've done about it. I know if you ever tell whenever I am anywhere and I say, oh, I study happiness, people get very excited. They have a lot to say. Um, but a lot of it is sort of, you know, there's a lot of questions and a lot of fuzziness. So I agree. I'm not sure that um, people would define it as satisfaction necessarily. However, I do think when you start to, because at the start of my class every year, I sort of have my students free associate. So I get a sense of, you know, a random 30 undergraduates every semester, every year, um, what they think. And that's sort of my taking the pulse of what, um, of what people think in general. And they do come around to the idea of satisfaction. Um, sometimes it's a little loftier. Sometimes they talk about fulfillment. Um, but I think that there is an understanding that, you know, that when you're happy, you're not looking for big changes, that there is this kind of contentment. Um, you might still have ambitions, you might still want to do things, but there is a kind of sense that there's a stability to it. And I think that... Um, People get there. It doesn't happen right away, but as you discuss and as more people chime in, they do eventually come around to this idea of satisfaction, and then it sort of fits and kind of settles in. Um, and I, I think psychologists, too, I mean, when they talk about, you know, the positive psychologists who are measuring happiness, they talk about, you know, life satisfaction. So I do think there is a connection there, um, and I think it, it does come about. I mean, I do think it is intuitively plausible to people. It may not be the first thing they say, but I do think it's there in their common sense understanding. Um, we've talked about philosophy and a little bit about religion and whatnot, and I, I'm just looking up uh, in uh, your book there. Um, is there uh, an ethical or moral dimension to happiness? Uh, we talked about uh, uh, happiness as, you know, a personal thing, and 
uh, one might argue in a bizarre way, someone who's psychopathic or sociopathic might get a, a sense of joy from doing something physically brutal or, or a, a bad boss might get a perverse sense of joy from constantly torturing his employees uh, in minor picayune ways. Um, uh, so happiness in and of itself, since it has that kind of subjective nature, uh, can one consider happiness being good or, uh, as a good, really? Or is it, you know, because we, like I said, if, if you, ha you know, injured your foot and I helped bandage it, whether that made me feel good about myself or not, I still did objectively, we would say a good thing. But uh, happiness doesn't seem to be, to me, as obvious as that. I guess you would call that maybe charity or or good faith or something. Uh, so is happiness then, can that be as at the top of the scale of what, of a human good, if you know what I'm trying to say? I do, I do. I, so I resist that. That's what Aristotle said. So Aristotle said, and, and many of the ancient moralists follow him, that all the eudaimonists, right, they thought eudaimonia, which is translated as happiness, is the greatest good. It's our, you know, our whole purpose in life is to try to achieve this wonderful, great good. Um, that's sort of on a par. If you think of physical health as an ideal that we sh strive for, this would be a kind of spiritual health. That's how Aristotle thought about it. So for him to be happy, to really achieve this very lofty state, you had to pursue your intellect to the utmost degree. You had to pursue your moral qualities. You had to have a wonderful character. You had to develop your potential intellectually and morally. You had to be this great person, this great citizen, all of that. Um, so for him, to say that one was happy required, it was an objective notion. And he would say, most people think they're happy. They're not. They're not really happy because they're not living up to their potential in the way that they could. The immoralist, the psychopath, anybody who's just sort of content, not really developing themselves, sort of content, not really doing much in life, Aristotle would just deny their happiness straight out. So I resist that because I think that we just don't talk that way today. We have no problem acknowledging the happiness of the immoralist and chastising them for it. Um, I think that in terms of motiv a motivator of what explains people's behavior, we often refer to happiness as to why they do self-centered, selfish, immoral things. Now, would I be happy doing those things? Probably not, but I'm not them. And so as you say, you know, as you started, you know, uh, saying there is that subjective nature of happiness that it does sort of depend on the person and what they need in order to be satisfied with their lives. And that's going to be very individual. Um, so I resist the idea because human beings are so varied in their motivations, in their interests, in what makes them tick. I do think that happiness can't be this great good that unites us all and we're just going to deny everybody who doesn't live up to their potentials. Happiness, we don't speak that way. And I just don't think, I think we've lost that connection. Is happiness still a good? Yes. Just like pleasure is a good. But obviously there are moral and immoral sources of pleasure. There are moral and immoral sources of happiness. Some people get their happiness through charity and being a good parent, being a good child, trying to do the best they can. Other people through, you know, deviously immoral actions, through running companies that are terrible to their employees, through being a terrible boss. You know, um, and what makes these people tick? I don't know. You know, I don't know what makes someone derive pleasure from something so mean. But obviously these people don't have a lot of empathy because if they did, clearly they wouldn't be able to do that. Um, or whatever, whoever they're abusing, they're not empathizing with, obviously. So whatever grounds their behavior ultimately that enables them to do nasty things to other people, I'm not going to deny their happiness. They do have this good and that it's not fair, you know, that they have something good. But is it fair when you have somebody who, you know, has other qualities like artistic quality, uh, talent, or, you know, I mean, not everybody who has one good quality has every good quality. Plenty of artists in the history, I'm sure you could provide many examples, had terrible moral values and did terrible political things and had a great talent at the same time. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, we don't want to say that just because you are an immoral person, you can't have anything good in your life. You yeah. might be happy. You might be happy through your act of immoral or morality. Um, that's who you are as a person, but we don't lose the right to chastise parts of your life um, just because we admit that you do have something that's good. Same as with pleasure. You know, you might have a moment of enjoyment or you might get enjoyment as a sadist or a masochist or some, uh, sorry, as a sadist or a psychopath or someone like that through hurting other people and, you know, that's, that's your source of pleasure. Uh, so I wanted to ask, well, just I was thinking as you were talking about uh, 
uh, artist, uh, Rainer Maria Rilke, a famous German language poet, probably one of the greatest poets of all time, uh, famously wrote a lot of great poems extolling uh, high values and, and, and joy and love and whatnot, but he was a scumbag in his own personal life. Um, right. I recently read a book by Laura Hillenbrand about, uh, called Unbroken about a fellow who was shot down over the Pacific. He spent 40 some days in the sea, then he was captured by the Japanese, was thrown in a prison of war camp. And, uh, uh, he was tortured by this one particularly sadistic guard who hated him, and he spent the rest of his life trying to reconcile that. And uh, it, it brought to mind the idea that there are some people who could find joy, like a Ted Bundy or a Dahmer, uh, that, that are going against society by doing evil things. But there's also those people who are freed, like the sadistic guard, to being having their perverse joys uh, because the society has somehow gone astray. And I'm wondering if happiness is, what is the cultural context of happiness? Um, uh, would happiness here in 21st century America, I mean, certainly if we look at Islamic culture, I think even though I, I deplore uh, Islamist uh, people uh, who want to kill everyone else and, and rape women and do that, some of their critiques on the, the lack of depth in Western society, I think, are spot on, just as I think that Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels had a lot of cogent critiques of America 200 years ago, even though I don't think their answers were the correct ones. Uh, what is the cultural context of happiness and how it varies from society to society? Because if you're, say, feeling good as an American in the 21st century and you went, uh, you know, you're happy with what values you think this society promotes or, uh, or vows, and then let's say you went to uh, Burma or, or Tibet or, or you know, somewhere, uh, Ecuador or something, and you find, oh, they don't value anything. They, they don't look at it the same way. Uh, to what degree do people conform to others' norms of happiness? Have you found anything about that? I mean, it's interesting. There, there's been some sort of research on cross-cultural, um, some cross-cultural studies on happiness that that sort of suggest that. Um, I mean, in the West, in America, in particular, because it's in our Declaration of Independence, and for other reasons, we are a little happiness obsessed. It's true. Combine that with the rampant capitalism and materialism, and you get what you have today. Do I think that? Um, it's awful today? No, certainly not. From what I understand, a lot of the young people are much more charitable. They're, you know, giving back in ways that older generations really didn't. So I don't think, despite all of that, it means that nobody or that few people here are interested in these other kinds of happiness where by you're part of a community, you're giving back, you're volunteering your time. I think a lot of young people today are, are concerned with exactly that, maybe in part because they feel or see the sort of where the rampant materialism takes you and they don't like that. Um, you know, more and more you hear kids taking gap years, taking a year off before they go to graduate school or even before starting college, you know, and, and volunteering somewhere, going to another country, seeing how the other part of the world lives. I think that the world is much more globalized today and where we didn't have a strong sense of what other people were doing or saying back in the day with the internet and everything else I think there is much more of a sort of connectedness um, than perhaps there used to be um, but in terms of the cross-cultural stuff on happiness that's kind of interesting um, so other cultures um, don't necessarily rate themselves nearly as happy um, as some of the Western cultures do but their suicide rates are not any higher their medication rates are considerably lower um, and so one explanation for you know if, if you're reporting not reporting a huge amount of happiness but your your objective measures are very high they have long lifespans low illnesses good quality of life not so much inequality income wise you know the objective measures are all there yet they're not reporting it on the subjective measures what's going on well, one explanation is that it's cultural, as you suggest. That so, so in some of the Eastern cultures that are more collectivist in nature, they're not taught to fixate on their own happiness. And so, when you ask them about it, they're not reporting it. They're not thinking about it. They're not sort of bragging about it, if you will. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're not very satisfied with their lives. And from an objective standpoint, it seems that in some cases they're probably more satisfied than we are. So, you know, I think that. 
you know, you make an interesting point. I do think that how we use the word here might not even be the same way that it is used in other places. I do think it depends on how you were raised, what your culture taught you to think about and to associate with happiness, how you find it and all of that. And I think that is very culture bound. I think you're right. But I do think that when you get outside of your own culture, and I think, again, with the internet and everything else, you can do that more and more, you do see how other cultures have a different take on this. Well, let me just talk about the internet, because uh, in the last 20 or so years since its rise, uh, people have now more of a means. I mean, you're in Brooklyn, I'm in Texas, and we're talking. We couldn't have done this even a decade or so ago. Uh, and yet, despite that connectedness, and I have... I have fans of my website. Uh, I have a young boy in India who, who's been following me, asking me questions. I have people all over the world. Uh, for Bizarrely, uh, my website, Cosmoetica, seems to get a few dozen views a day from Nepal and the Him Himalayan kingdoms. Who would have thought that a Buddhist would like me? Uh, but uh, on, the, on the flip side, despite the ability to connect more, there seems to be, if you look at studies that I've read about people who, who like to just troll and, 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 and harass people online, that people are, uh, that just spend their whole time just arguing online about picky points of this or that, whether it's something as silly as the, the daily sports score or something about global warming. Uh, do you think that the internet has become a wild card in modern society and going forward in the decades and centuries, assuming humanity survives, do you think that technology is going to have an increased role in happiness, pro or con? I do. Again, I think it's it, 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 it's easy to overreact. I don't think technology has nearly the influence that people, you know, panic about. I, I you know, I laugh. I read something once about when you know when the printing press started, people were panicking that nobody's going to be able to write anymore, and then when the telephone was invented, people were like, "Oh, this is the downfall of society because." Nobody is going to write letters anymore. And then the internet and then email and oh, nobody's going to call anymore and texting. Nobody's going to talk anymore. We're going to lose our ability to converse face to face. You know, I mean, I, I, technology has an effect on us. Clearly, it, it enables certain things. It makes other things more difficult. Are we losing some skills as a result of it? Perhaps. Are we gaining other skills? Absolutely. Um, but I, again, going back to the ancient Greeks, 2,000 years ago, if you read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics or you read Plato's Republic, the things he talks about are exactly the same issues we face today. You know, the, the, the quandaries, the, the moral breakdowns, the, the temptation, the effect of money and materialism on your motivations, the parts of your, uh, they speak about the soul, but just the parts of your sort of psychology warring with each other and how to achieve a kind of balance. What the Stoics say about controlling your emotions and overcoming adversity, you know, all of these things are, you know, in some ways part of our popular culture already. So I'm not saying that none of this survives, but but despite the fact that we've made such technological progress, we're still asking the same questions. We're still struggling to find the same answers. So I do think that the internet is having an effect on us, um, socially and otherwise. But I also think, let's not overreact. I, I had a good conversation in one of my classes last semester about, about exactly this. We were, I was lecturing on Aristotle's view of friendship, and we were just talking about the different kinds of friends that he talks about. He has three different kinds of friendship that he distinguishes. And, you know, Facebook came up and um, all of these kinds of modern things and, you know, tweeting and, and social media in general. And I was surprised because here's a group of 20-somethings and, and, you know, 19, 20-year-olds and 20-somethings. And they're, they were very sort of like, I, you know, I did that, I do that, but it's not the focus of my life. Yes, I want to see my friends in real life. No, I don't think I've lost the ability to talk to other people because I, I engage in Facebook every so often. Some of them were sick of it. Some of them were not even going to do it anymore. They sort of were like, eh, it's all getting old. Um, so, you know, with these new, you know, Snapchat, Instagram, all of these other things that are constantly coming out that the kids flock to and then it's the next thing. You know, they're temporary. They have a splash when they come out, but I don't think fundamentally they change our interactions with others, the fact that we are social creatures by nature. Yes, some people are more comfortable 
keeping people more at a distance. Other people need people all the time, and we all vary in our tolerance of others and how much we need, whether we're comfortable getting married or we're more comfortable not being married but having friends or whatever. But most of us are social creatures. We need other people. We need to interact with other people, and our happiness is going to depend on that to a large extent. So being able to engage with others in a meaningful way I think is going to be crucial for most people. How they do that, what kinds of people they associate with, oh, that's going to be a personal choice. Now that gets back to, when you talk about the collective, that gets back to something that was broached earlier. Um, uh, and that's, uh, I had mentioned that, you know, in the Constitution, the right to pursue happiness is one of the few enumerated things. Uh, you would think that uh, given all the complexities that we have, there might have been a few more enumerated things rather than something as nebulous as happiness. But uh, I guess that's one of the, the strengths of the Constitution uh, is that uh, it, it's open for interpretation, despite what some more Luddite minds might think. But uh, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, the role of government or the role of collective society to promote happiness and whether it's a good thing. And the reason I say that is if you go around to especially high schools, and probably it's the similar uh, in, uh, in college, I would assume, uh, if you go to the uh, high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, oftentimes you'll see a lot of these, I think, very trite and banal maxims. You know, you can be anything, which I once, I had a show a, a few months ago with a philosopher who said that's one of the most destructive things you can tell anyone because you can't be everything. Not, you know, you, I, I'm not going to play center field for the New York Yankees, even if I was 21 and not 51. I just don't have the ability. But do you think a lot of this uh, promotion, this idea that, Everyone is special. You can do everything. It's just setting people up for a fall because while everyone is genetically unique, uniqueness is not specialness. And if we're talking about happiness, as you define it, as self-satisfaction, there has to be some base set of reality. Uh, as you know, If you're consistently overweight and your family's overweight, you're not going to ever be a supermodel. Uh, someone like me who lacks hand-eye coordination, I'm never going to be Derek Jeter or LeBron James. And so do you think that that there's a well-intended uh, sp sort of spike put in the punch uh, of, of the idea of happiness by people who don't really get it? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you said a lot of interesting things. I mean, on the one hand, I'd argue, look, when you're young, it's much easier to pick up new skills, new things. Part of the reason you're not coordinated is probably because you weren't particularly interested in sports when you were young and you just never really did it. Um, a lot of skills or, or things that, you know, one pursues, um, you know, I'm thinking of Malcolm Gladwell's outliers, you know, the 10,000 hour rule. I mean, yes, there's a genetic component. Obviously, some people are genetically superior to others. But most other people, you know, especially when you're young, you know, it's sort of what you gravitate to. And that is, unfortunately, with luck, you know, going to be a function of what your parents' interests were, what you were exposed to, et cetera. But I do think that, you know, I mean, look, Muxy Bogues played for the Charlotte Hornets. When I was young, I grew up watching him play. The guy was shorter than me. He was like 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. Mm -hmm. He was a professional basketball player, told his whole life, he'll never be a bad basketball player. You're too short. He loved basketball. He played. He got good. He had, you know, but you don't become good at anything unless you do it. And you do it a lot and you have to practice. So I think that's the message they're trying to send to high school students. And that's the message I tell my students, you know, look, don't say, well, I'm just like this. You can be whatever you want to be. You know, if you're not comfortable having bad habits, change your habits. Are you going to be radically different? No. I mean, the older you start changing yourself, obviously, you know, you only have so much time in the world, but you can always pick up a new skill, a new habit, a new whatever. You know, it always bothered me when people say, well, I'm just a late person. I'm just a messy person. Uh, I'm just, you know, that C student. No, you're choosing to be that C student. If you're content with C's, that's fine. But the thought that you're relegated to that because you're not capable of doing more, that's crazy. We're all capable of a lot. We just lack the willpower. We lack the belief, the confidence. I don't know what. Um, but if you have the will to change yourself or do something, I that you know you can you can change yourself a lot. You can change a lot about yourself, particularly things you don't like. Um, it just takes the doing. Well, I, I would agree and disagree. To uh, For example, one of the things that I, I've seen posters of is something that says, never, 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 never give up. And that, I know what they're trying to say, but I, I, could, I could just add two words there, stalker's manifesto underneath that to show you that, that, that that's not always a good thing. You know, uh, you know, so 
um, you know, you have to have a base talent. Like I'm nearsighted and, you know, yes, now I guess I, if I wanted to, I could get my eyes corrected uh, or whatnot, but I, you can, you can work within what you've got. Uh, I don't think, like I said, I no no amount of practice is going to make me a, a professional athlete. But uh, um, let me ask you though uh, a few more questions. Uh, what what is the the final uh, take that you have in your book or in your own personal ideas about happiness? Um, do do you view it more from the cultural perspective? Do you strike a balance between the personal and the, the collective? Or is it more the sort of qualia idea that everyone's sense of happiness, just like your red might be different than my red, we don't know. Uh, what What is your final, uh, you know, well, scale? Well, I, I think, so one thing I would say, and I think we sort of touched on this earlier, but and I meant to say this earlier, but, but I didn't get it out. Um, Happiness is a degree notion, right? So it ranges in intensity. So, so I think happiness picks out a range of emotional states. What they have in common is that they all imply a certain amount of satisfaction with your life. But just like you can be, you know, more or less satisfied, you can be more or less happy. So to just have the most bare basic contentment, sort of the sense that just nothing is blatantly wrong, you know, you're not experiencing joy, you're not, it's not ecstasy, it's just sort of basic, I'm not even thinking about contentment, that might be at the very low end. And then again, at the far, far, far opposite end would be, you know, these kinds of extreme joy that you experience probably once or twice in your life, maybe even, you know, um, they typically maybe happen when you have these kinds of big events, it's fleeting, you know, it, it kind of settles back down, you have these kinds of spikes in happiness, um, but then it kind of settles down again, so depending on, you know, what, what's happening in your life. So I do think happiness is individual uh, and subjective. I think it's a reflection of your values, your priorities, your ability to balance all of the things you want in life against what you can actually achieve in life. I think that's sort of the wisdom of the Stoics. Um, I think the at, at the end, you have a lot more control than you realize, than most people realize, um, by looking outward all the time at the world and getting upset and having these expectations, making these demands. Again, the wisdom of the Stoics is to say, look, I have, I don't have control over the world, but I have control over my desires. I have control over my attitudes and judgments. So if I don't have to see this as a bad thing, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. You know, getting fired. I mean, things that historically you might be upset about, you might say, you know what, this is, an, this is a chance for me to explore something new, to, to, to work somewhere different, to pick up a new line of work, whatever. So um, I think that at the end of the day, it is going to depend on the person and their values and their outlook and what they want and what they're getting and all of that. But I do think we have a lot more control over our happiness than we realize. And so it can be empowering to sort of realize that, you know, it's, it's my own mindset that I can control and a lot of my happiness depends on that. One of the things that we haven't spoken of, and I just wanted to touch on, uh, uh, and I'd be probably remiss by not touching on it, is <clears throat> the idea that, that happiness is somehow inextricably bound with love. And I was just looking up the quotation from First Corinthians thirteen thirteen, and it says, "And now these three remain: these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love." And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, uh, is the idea of love, the idea of romantic love, that I mean, yes, it goes back to Orpheus, Eurydice, and then Romeo and Juliet. But, you know, when we think of, like, marriage, most societies have arranged marriages de facto or in fact. Um, and I'm wondering if modern society's idea that there's someone out there for everyone, uh, that you, you have to be a part of a couple. I'm wondering if that is something that's been exacerbated in the last hundred or so years, especially here in the West, and if that's a good or a bad thing. Have you... Uh, Ever, have you, you know, I've taken thought about this. I wrote a paper on love, actually. So I have thought of quite a bit about love. Um, and so one of the, so I mean, you say a lot of interesting things. One of the things that I sort of talk about. So the paper I wrote, just to sort of give you some context, um, there was a paper written in the Journal of Philosophy um, by someone who was um, reviewing the psychological literature on resilience and finding it very troubling. And so what the psychologists have found is that we're a lot more resilient than we think. When we face adversities, and the specific adversity he was talking about was bereavement, right? So this is like spousal loss. Yeah. We 
despite the fact that we have these expectations that if I lose my spouse, I'll be single forever, I should wear black for the rest of my life, I'm going to be miserable, I'll never survive the death of my spouse, I won't want to live, blah, blah, blah. So despite these sort of overly romantic notions that many people harbor, um, when people actually lose a spouse and are faced with this, they actually fare very well. So yes, their happiness takes a little bit of a dip for a little bit of time, but not only do they recover to their previous levels of happiness sooner rather than later, they recover in like less than a year. Uh, within two years, most people are remarried. Like they just go on and keep living. Um, and so the, Dan Mahler is the one who I was sort of attacking in my paper. So he wrote this paper in the Journal of Philosophy, basically saying, "Oh, this is terrible, right? Ruining the fact that people are resilient. Are resilient? Yes, it, evolutionarily, it's great that we can recover our happiness. But isn't that a terrible thing overall? Because doesn't it imply that we don't really love our loved ones? That we don't really value our significant others?" that were so replaceable, and he says all of these kinds of mean things. And I reply to him in my paper, and I argue that I don't think that's the case at all. I think that, as you said at the beginning, having that attitude towards our resilience is a function of this overly romanticized view of one man, one woman, or whatever, um, and that you're going to, you know, you're, you're this couple that was destined, and there's yeah. only one person you have to get along. That's crazy, right? We live in a, a world of how many billions of people, and you're telling me there's one other person you could possibly get along with? That's insane. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds, if not thousands, or tens of thousands of people you could probably be married to right now that would be just as great as your current wife. Same thing for me and my husband. I mean, I, I, you know, I love my husband. We get along great. We're the best of friends. But I don't have any doubt that there's other people who I could get along with also, and he could probably get along with. Maybe some better, maybe some worse, maybe some the same. And I don't even know how you can do some of these things. So, but, but the point is that, you know, it, it shouldn't be surprising that we are able to love many people and think of all the different people in your life that you love in different ways, you know, that you can meet other people and pick up after you lose your spouse. I don't think that should be surprising. I don't think it should be seen as a bad thing. I think it's something we should celebrate. Um, so I think that love is an important part of happiness for many people, but I think how you find that love depends. Some people like being married. All of the statistics show married people fare better. We tend to be happier overall, we tend to be healthier, we live longer, we suffer adversities better, lower rates of depression, live longer, all of that stuff. Now, why that is the case, nobody knows. You can't causation correlation, you know, it could be that people who have these dispositions already are more likely to get married, and that's why the statistics show this. So nobody is saying that marriage causes these things, but there is a correlation there. Put as much stock in it as you want. I think that, you know, some people you know, are better suited for marriage, other people for friendship, other people for whatever. But these overly romanticized notions of, you know, one person for you and your destiny and all that, I mean, that's crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, 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 um, think, and, I think the term yeah. soulmate is a, is a terrible term because it, it means that soulmate singular, not right. soulmates and all that stuff. Um, I want to end the interview... Uh, with another segment that gives you a, a final say so uh, to end it. But I want to end this segment uh, talking about language and how we speak about happiness. And, and, and uh, in the arts, for example, one of the things that annoys the hell out of me, and I've made this distinction, is I talk about, uh, I, I believe, for example, that there are things in this world that are objective. I'm not a total subjectivist because I think subjectivity, if you're a total subjectivist, there's no point in doing anything. Uh, and so when people often talk about they they like this film or like that film, what they're really saying is they think it's good, but they use the term like because they value their emotion over their intellectual capacity. And for me, emotion is simply a part of the intellect. Uh, if I'm stirred intellectually, I'm going to feel good about myself. Uh, but most people don't recognize that connection. And in a similar way, I think people sort of bastardize the idea of happiness or love with happiness as being a need, that I need to have this, rather than looking at it as just a desire or a want. Because if you want something, it's not something that's essential, but your life is better off for it. But if you need something, you get to that sort of stalker mentality. I need this girl's attention kind of thing. Uh, do you think that the way that we talk about happiness, uh, the way that we unintentionally misuse words, has something to do with us not attaining that happiness? Possibly. I, I think
think it's, it's an interesting point, not something I necessarily have thought about too much, but I, I, it, that seems right to me. Um, I, I'd be inclined to agree with that. Um, I'm not sure I have that much more to add on that okay. topic, but, but I, I think that sounds right. Um, it's, again, it's not something I had really thought about previously, but, but it's an interesting point, certainly. Okay, well, uh, let's end this segment in the final segment. We'll wrap things up and we'll do that in a moment. I have been speaking with Christine Vetrano. Uh, she's written a book called The Nature and Value of Happiness. And we've been talking about both of those things in relation to happiness for about an hour here. Um, let me just uh, ask you, are you planning any further writings on the subject of happiness? And if not, what's your next topic? Um, so I, we did, I did another book um, that has already come out. It was published by Columbia University Press with Steve Kahn. Um, and in that book, um, so it's called uh, uh, Living Well, sorry, The Good Life, Philosophical Reflections on Living Well. Mm -hmm. um, and we, oh, sorry, butchered that. <laughs> Happiness and Goodness, Philosophical Reflections on Living Well. And in it, we talk um about so there's a section on happiness which is a lot of what we've been discussing today this idea that it's this kind of subjective thing today um we're in that book concerned with the good life and what that means so if you say that someone has a meaningful life or, or a fulfilling life or they're living the good life you know what are, what does that entail and philosophers have sort of historically going back to mill and the distinction between higher and lower pleasures, and even Aristotle before that with this idea of moral and intellectual virtue. Philosophers have liked to say that, well, if you're not you know, exerting yourself intellectually, if you're not living and pursuing the sort of finer things in life, you're not really happy, you're not really living a good life. And we sort of attack that. Um, we consider all the different ways in which people say your life is objectively good, and we sort of attack that and say, look, to really live a good life, um, you're happy, and you're, you're achieving happiness in morally acceptable ways. So, and we leave that open. What is morally acceptable? Well, that depends on your moral theory. So we kind of don't commit to one theory. What we say is, it, it, there's something weird about saying, Hitler lived a good life just because he was happy, assuming that he was happy. We're not comfortable with that. So we said, look, you might say Hitler was happy, but he didn't live a good life, that's for sure. Why? Because look at the immoral things he did. So if you're finding happiness in morally acceptable ways, we argue that's all there is to the good life. And we talk about the book of Ecclesiastes, we talk about Epicurus, and we sort of make connections between those two that perhaps haven't been made before and um, sort of reach this understanding that to really live a good life is to just enjoy your life, you know, again, in morally acceptable ways, but just enjoy what you do. This idea that you have to pursue finer things and better things, well, not everybody enjoys finer things. Not everybody's into doing philosophy. They like to read, you know, what they like to read or they don't like to read or whatever. And so we sort of say, look, it, people are varied in their interests. And so as long as you're doing something that you enjoy, you like your life, you're satisfied, and you're not doing anything horrendously immoral, we think that's all there is to living a good life. So that's the book that we just did. Um, after that, I'm sort of, I'm thinking about my next project. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Um, one thing that interests me is talking about these ancient theorists that we've been talking about today um, and using sort of modern social science, um, the research that they're doing to sort of validate a lot of what these ancient theorists said because they didn't have the social science back themselves up. They were just looking at people and sort of observing. Um, but I think that there's a lot of truth to what Plato and Aristotle and Epicurus and Epictetus and these Stoics and whoever else said. And I think that it would be interesting to sort of bring these two worlds together to talk about the ancient view and then to say, look, look, this is what they've found. This is why they're right, or these are the ways in which you know we can understand that this is an important part of human nature because look, it's reflected in all of this social science. So that's my next project, hopefully. <laughs> well, uh, let me just end then. Uh, do you consider yourself happy, and do you think that it matters generally? Yeah, I mean, it matters to me. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do think I'm a pretty happy person. I'm very lucky. Um, I have a great job. I love my job. I would literally do it for free. Um, and I have a great family. Um, I'm very lucky there as well. Um, I have very little to complain about. So uh, I am happy, but I think it's important to be happy also. I think it's important to be in touch with your own happiness and um, hopefully get it. <laughs> well, below this video, I'll link to your Brooklyn College webpage as well as uh, your Amazon page for your book. And uh, I want to thank you for spending some time talking about it.